We're going to talk about ventilation, because is it important? Well, we're all sure about that. However, I'd like to remind you that an orthodontic treatment, is it useful in someone's life? We don't have uh, formal evidence about that. We can talk about uh, periodontal diseases and issues. Okay, but high-grade scientific reviews, well, we don't really have a formal evidence. The only evidence we have is that an early treatment on uh, oral breathing is going to improve sleeping in children. That's a certainty. So I'd like to go back to the basics. We can uh, treat people, improve their self-esteem, improve occlusion, improve chewing, we improve uh, breathing. My microphone is not working. Uh, maybe I'll take... Uh, okay, no. So, why is it useful to breathe through the nose? Well, we could breathe through the mouth. And what is the best experience for breathing through the mouth? I'm asking you a question. What is the best human experience of uh, breathing only through the mouth? No. It's general anesthesia. Because unless you are having a uh, surgery in the mouth, you always have a tube in your nose. So during general anesthesia, you breathe only through the mouth, not through the nose. So anesthesiologists have shown that breathing through a tube that goes through the mouth increases brain temperature and therefore it is bad for brain oxygenation versus uh, nose breathing. What elements do we take in consideration? The nose is there because air cannot be directly used by the lungs. It must be warmed and uh, moisturized. And that's the reason why anesthesiologists have changed their machines and device so that the air that the patient breathes in is uh, warm and humid. The uh, air is warmed up by uh, capillary uh, blood vessels in the nose, and you all have that image uh, of someone breathing through the nose and having big circles under their eyes. It's, that's not because they're tired, that's because the brain says, I cannot warm up the, the air because uh, the uh, air does not go through the nose. So the brain tells the blood vessels, Please, please, please make new capillary blood vessels because we need to uh, increase the uh, exchange. So when children have dark circles under their eyes, it's because their brain have developed a reserve system to increase the thermal exchange, except that the uh, reserve cannot be used because the brain does not understand that there is a total blockage of the uh, nose breathing. So. This is absolutely essential to breathe through the nose so that the air we breathe in can be used by the lungs. And uh, air is moisturized by uh, water evaporation. And, and the, the water will also be uh, purified. You know, if you uh, take care of children, pediatricians tell you, oh, that child was asthmatic, and now I've been able to decrease uh, all the uh, asthma uh, medication, but you cannot change uh, asthma when the child is allergic, because the child breathes through the nose doesn't mean that the child is no longer allergic, except that the nose will clean the air of all the allergens, and so if the child has uh, skin allergies uh, to nickel, and if nickel goes on your skin, uh, you're not going to develop eczema, but if you're on your watch, you have a nickel bracelet and you wear it 24 hours a day, there will be allergy. So when you remove allergens quickly, there are less allergic fits. And the only way to remove the allergens from the air is to breathe through the nose. So the air is warmed up 
moisturized and purified. This has a morphogenetic action. The nose will help develop the, the median space in the face, will help with growth. Jean Delair used to say, children bear the indelible marks of nasal insufficiency in childhood. So the earlier you will treat the issue, the better it will be and a morphologic, uh, normal morphologic uh, functioning will develop. The longer you wait, the more sequelae there will be, and in the end, the, the adult will have noses, a, a bone, a nose bone that corresponds to the way he breathed in childhood. Ventilation insufficiency, it's an insufficient quantity of air being breathed in. It can be due to a number of factors, but what really, mat really matters to us and what we can act on is uh, oral breathing and uh, nose uh, breathing insufficiency. This is a picture I like very much. It was given to me by Talman. It's the ultrasound image of a, an unborn baby. And even within the mother's womb, we don't breathe air. We breathe in amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid goes through the nose, the nasal fossa. It's a bit like a watering uh, tube hose. The, if you put air in the nasal fossa, they will swell, and the same goes for amniotic fluid. The morphogenic action is the action of the airflow on the bone structures, and it's absolutely essential. Right. Dynamic ultrasound during the 12th week will show you this oropharynx acquisition of the breathing process. I'll go a little faster because we're late. Why disjunction? Because, according to me, there can be no functional treatment on a deficient bone structure. If you have a small cheese box and you want to place a big cheese in the box, it's not going to work. And if you change the box to a bigger box, then you'll be able to put the bigger cheese in. And for me, I mean, I uh, consider that a functional action of our treatment is essential. However, if the bone is not normal to begin with, it's very difficult to change the function. So the bone depends on the function, the function sets the bone, and if you want to change the function, you have to change the bone first, and unless you do that, you will not obtain good results. Of course, there are exceptional cases I'm speaking in general. So why disjunction? Because it is the only action that will help you enlarge the bone, move it apart, and we will see, for instance, it will enlarge the nasal fossa. For those of you who take uh, face x-rays, well, look at them. Upfront x-rays are very useful, and I advise you to take them with every patient. We have learned to look at our children in 2D. We're not familiar with 3D. Now there is 3D, and we have 3D intraoral scans, but we are not capable of looking at the bone in all the structures. However, what is the main factor in adult sleep apnea? Everybody says a small mandible. Not at all. Not at all. What really matters is the transversal dimension. They are tight. And if they are tight, it's because they were tight when they were children. So if you don't change the bone when the child is young, then the adult will have bad breathing. So disjunction will remove all the nerve connections. And in very little time, because disjunction takes place in like 10 days, you will have maximum result. The bone will be in the right place. There will be enough room for the tongue. And uh, the muscles will be disconnected. So this is an x-ray. You see that the piriform uh, orifices are absolutely essential. Look at these orifices. They must be one-third of the biorbital distance. And if you look at children, 80% of the children will have this deficit of the transversal dimension. So the earlier you will help them, the more disjunction you will be able to perform, and the better it will be for the final result to bringing them back to normal. Why is it important? This is a, uh, a picture showing normal nasal fossa, and then uh, there is uh, nasal fossa with inflammation. When the mucosa is inflamed, it's like a 
mushroom, it takes up too much space. So forget about function. How do you want a child to breathe normally when the everything is blocked by inflammation? Of course, you can give them anti-inflammatory drugs. However, if you perform a disjunction, the mucosa will go one side, will go to one side and to the other, and it will not have time to develop. So during the short time of disjunction, the child will feel air going through the nose, and it's better when there is proprioception. When the child feels the air, you can treat him better. Right, this being said, disjunction, you're all familiar with that. Disjunction is uh, with posterior pivot and nasal pivot. So you enlarge in this direction. So you have to enlarge more than you would want because the muscles will then straighten up the axis. You have to have 30% disjunction more than what you actually need. And this junction is only seen when the two incisors move apart. If the incisors don't move apart, you have not performed this junction. You've maybe expansion, maybe alveolar expansion, but not this junction. And this junction is what you need because the piriform orifices are going to change. And, you know, this is very old. Randall Arsen showed it on these two skulls. On the one hand, you have normal disjunction, normal orifices. The four incisors are uh, shaped like a fan. And, you know, disjunction is not only when there is abnormal molar relationship. There may be a normal posterior molar relationship. And, yes, yet the uh, four incisors are fanning out. And I recommend to perform this junction, and you will see some fabulous results. Very quick and fabulous, because the child will be able to breathe through the mouth. If you don't, through the nose, sorry. If you don't do that, your orifices will remain small, and there will be dysfunction of the nose. This is a child, okay, disjunction. So the, the device, uh, when you have a molar relationship, it may be a little difficult. We use anterior, an anterior device that, so that we can perform the disjunction from caspid to caspid. And when the, your molars are normal, you will not have a catastrophic result, because sometimes if you have a catastrophic result, it's very difficult to compensate. In the premaxillary area, that is between the spine and the uh, cuspids, what do we have just above? The piriformis orifices. So if you increase their size, very simply, the child will be able to use his nose or her nose. You'll be able to rehabilitate the child. It's like a, a train with one wheel hanging in, you know, out of the... the, the the tracks, if you put it back on the track, everything will be back to normal. So, x-rays, essential. Now, this is the drawing you need to learn. And remember, looking at my watch, this is essential. Two things, by orbitary distance and the performing orifices, one-third. If you less than one-third, perform uh, disjunction. The orifices are too small. And you have the alveolar dental relationship, the IZ relationship, bimolar versus bizygomatic. And this is what will provide the, the maximum uh, width that you can achieve uh, with an alveolar dental disjunction. Now, Leonardo da Vinci's orbitonasal uh, relationship, one-third, IZ's relationship, half, Maximum width of the arch, this is okay for alveolar expansion. If you reach the maximum, stop there. You've reached the maximum. And if you perform a very accurate analysis of all your patients, looking at them upfront, you will find very often that they have a maxillary uh, exo-alveolar protrusion. They have a small maxilla. The occlusion is okay as far as the molars are concerned. However, because the molars are already reaching maximum expansion, whether you use a plate or a quad, disjunction will happen, maybe a self-ligating system, but you already have uh, a uh, two, a buccal protrusion on both sides. So it's not going to work because you have not changed the orifices. The child will grow, but will keep that abnormal breathing pattern. Clinical exam, absolutely essential. As soon as you have uh, the uh, tight 
piriformis orifices, you will find nocturnal or day signs of abnormal breathing. If the child breathes a lot in the morning, wakes up during the night, wants to have a bottle, has a dry mouth, this is a sign of uh, oral breathing. If the child has trouble going to sleep, if the child uh, will sweat during the night, because, you know, that famous increase of the uh, brain temperature, because of the skull, there can be no thermal exchange. So the child will start uh, sweating from the occiput. Is the child tired in the morning? Does he have uh, difficulty getting up, going to school? Is he tired in school? A child who doesn't sleep well also has troubles in school. Now, all children not doing a good job in the school do not necessarily suffer from uh, uh, abnormal breathing patterns, but it may happen. And what is the best communication? What else can you say? Then telling the mother, look, you've brought my child to me because he has those fanning out incisors, doesn't look good on the school picture. You're telling me that the child is not sleeping well and there is a medical issue here and we are healthcare providers, professionals, so we have to be healthcare professionals. And if the mother sees that after the disjunction the child will, will be more attentive in school and doing uh, his homework better or not be so nervous in school. The child will not have uh, a difficult uh, time at night and uh, the, ch the mother will understand that something has happened. So for communication as well, you have to stick to those very medical factors when you talk to the parents. It's essential. And also, if there are allergies, uh, obviously ask uh, for an ENT consult. There is a Talmans ventilation sheet, and it provides useful information. If the child snores, like an adult, that is not normal. Children shouldn't snore. Apnea in the child uh, can happen. Five to ten percent of the children uh, you will see in your clinics will may have apnea, but sometimes it's not apnea, apnea to speak of. It's simply abnormal sleeping with snoring, but no apnea. And you can uh, increase um, the capacity to discover other abnormal ventilation patterns by uh, talking to the child. These are five children. They all have lips that do not close, or if they do close, then the chin is contracted. It means that during the night, when they relax, they will breathe through the mouth. Very often, I'm, asking, I'm telling parents, I don't want to know whether the child snores, but does he make that noise, like air in a tube? And they say, yes, of course. And the brothers and sisters, the siblings, yes, 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 they hear that in the room. So even though you may have very few clinical elements in favor of disjunction, perform disjunction. You can help the child breathe, you can rehabilitate the child, and he or she will feel much better. Tight arches with a major front crowding. Enlarge tonsils, look at the tonsils, and look behind, look at uh, vegetation as well. We have uh, chances here of uh, seeing abnormal anatomy with the x-ray, functional examination, Gudin's functional nostril reflex, very simple. You pinch the nostrils and you look whether they go back to their normal shape very quickly. And you all have a little mirror, so you place it in front of the nostrils and you see nothing going through the nostrils. That is not normal. Don't start orthodontic treatment when the nostrils aren't functioning. And also, I, I use the Arino aerophonoscope, a device invented by Jean Delaire that helps you measure the uh, nasal flow right and left and the mouth flow and it's absolutely it's very helpful it can also help you for rehabilitation because it gives you provides you with a very useful picture of what is happening and the child can see what is happening it gives you curves and statistics so you can actually explain and then uh, there are also various uh, devices uh, with uh, rings or all kinds of uh, shapes. Uh, all you have, all you need is a sufficient force for 10 to 15 days and you will achieve disjunction. And again, you can tell disjunction has happened when the incisors have moved away and you can place a finger between the incisors. And 
parents are worried about that because every time they turn this, the device, they see the uh, teeth moving apart. But that is important. The more space you gain between the teeth, the more space you gain in the nasal fossa. You know, if you insert your fingers in the orifices, you are in the same level as the uh, cuspid. So. The disjunction can be uh, seen with an x-ray. You see the open suture. It tells you that you can perform disjunction until the ages of 11 or 12. After that, it's too late. Sometimes you have to do surgery, a very simple surgery, not necessary to do osteotomy. It's simply a small osteotomy incision. And in young adolescents or in adolescents or young adults, you can achieve the same action uh, that you would have achieved with a disjunctor. A disjunction device. The indication is maxillary tight uh, arch, and you have to have a fragment that is open and can be grafted. There is movement towards the downwards of the maxilla because if you uh, have to have the maxilla that goes in the same direction, uh, in the sagittal direction, the uh, anchoring molar will be. Uh, Proclined, so you have to increase the vertical dimension in a patient that breathes through the mouth. It's not the best, but if you rehabilitate the child, you have put the wheel back on track and it will improve. So this is a study with 180 children, half girls, half boys, retrospective study, 172 cases, the majority of which had perfect occlusion, no other treatment than this junction and rehabilitation, 20% increase of the nasal fossa size, but here we were disappointed because if we took the cases uh, eight years after the disjunction, we found that they still had abnormal breathing. Yes, we had increased the size of the nasal fossa in the uh, orifices. Yes, a ratio was better, but it was not back to normal. So I tried to do the same study on uh, children uh, four or five years after the disjunction, because seven or eight years after the disjunction, there is a uh, pathological action on the bone and there, you, you cannot compensate for it. So if you do it earlier, four or five, then we can uh, resort to revert to a normal morphotype. Disjunction can be very quick, local anesthesia, but and you do it in the in the clinic. No, I don't think it's worthwhile. It's better to take 10 to 15 days uh, because uh, it's better. Now, you have to have good parents and uh, for the parents it's very difficult sometimes with a disjunctor, sometimes they have trouble. We sometimes do it in the clinic. We ask the child to come back every day so that we can turn the, the, the key because when the parents don't understand, it's very difficult. But two weeks, you know, it goes fast. And compared with quadelics, you can achieve a disjunction in a quadelics in a very uh, young child, five or six years old. But it's slower. And the inf inflammation of the mucosa will not be taken by surprise. So you will not get that proprioceptive effect of the child feeling air in the nose. Quick disjunction, two weeks is the best solution for me. Hyper correction, at least 20%, so that you have final satisfactory action. So we do it in two weeks. We check after three months uh, and uh, we perform selective grinding of the uh, milk teeth to uh, have uh, a good bilateral alternate uh, occlusion because on previously they did not wear the teeth on one side. So if you improve the uh, occlusion, then they will be able to chew on both sides. I have seen children uh, with a disjunctor kept for one year or year and a half, almost like a retainer. Forget that. It's bad because uh, the the, uh, the uh, sleep apnea will increase because the disjunction device pushes the tongue down. So a disjunction device can be worn for two to three months, like a, a cast. If you remove it and there is a relapse, it means that you have not reestablished the function. But do not use it as a retainer. It's forced retention, and it's not good. It doesn't change the function. You will get a relapse the, way, the day you remove the device. If you have a cleft, then uh, you remove the uh, disjunctor and you use a palatal arch so as not to disrupt uh, the tongue and rehabilitate the child, but never more than three months with a disjunction device. Surgery for an adult, 
you open up, you make one osteotomy uh, incision, and you close up. In adults, it's difficult because uh, they will recover from the surgery in one week, but for three months, they will have uh, very wide incisors. And in some cases, for social purposes, it's not very good. Here we have patients we uh, re-operate on uh, for mandibular surgery, and we see that the uh, osteotomy leaves no scars, absolutely no scars. You open up the suture, but the bone will reform, and there will be nothing showing uh, two years later. Rehabilitation, that's what we're here for. Rehabilitation should be passive and active at the same time. In uh, Normandy, we have to wait three years to see a speech therapist. And sometimes we can never get through to the speech therapist, so we have decided to do everything ourselves. We use screens like this one during the disjunction. We perform the disjunction, we open the suture, and we place that in the patient's mouth immediately. They can feel the air through the nose, and they have to keep that. And if they can keep that, you've already almost fin finished the treatment successfully. This is during the time they wear the, disjun the disjunction device. So when you uh, lock the disjunction device and you remove it, it's approximately two months. It's almost like the uh, Vix Vaporub uh, medication. You've all had a, a blocked nose and you use that mental uh, ointment to uh, breathe better. It doesn't, make any, it doesn't make any difference. It's just the smell. Because of the mental, the mint smell, the brain feels it. It's proprioception. It, the same here. You open up the suture, the child feels air going through the nose, and then you can uh, improve the function. And if the nose is closed, then the child will spit out the device you placed in his mouth. And the child has felt the air going through, and that is exactly the same thing. I uh, did it for my child. I performed the disjunction. I put some uh, adhesive tape. It worked really well. I can't do it on my patients, but it worked on my child. Use, use adhesive tape uh, for your children. For your patients, use this kind of device. And once you remove the uh, device, you can use uh, the disjunction device, you can use this. It's uh, for those of you who knew the uh, Salagnac uh, lingual lifting device, you know what I'm talking about. So, disjunction device, and then the um, retainer pushing out the tongue. The tongue is on the palate, the mouth is closed, it should work. There are silicone, hard silicone uh, devices, because the children may grind them away in two weeks. And they may have to keep them for almost like uh, when the last uh, teeth uh, have erupted. So children keep them uh, from the age of 5 to the age of 13. We see them four times a year. And if they do it properly, well, sometimes we looked at the stat statistics and 80% of the children in whom we did the disjunction and who wore the retainer, everything was okay. The teeth will also go where the uh, jaws need to be. If everything works well, there's no reason why the teeth should grow in the wrong position. We have also uh, other kinds of devices uh, to measure airflow, not very easy to use every day. There is a study in 33 children with the aerophonoscope device. We found that we could make breathing symmetrical. Again, I will show you a clinical case very quickly. I don't know why, but uh, before treatment, there is always a difference between one nostril and the other. And when you perform disjunction and rehabilitation, you have a 50-50 split between the two nostrils. And it explains why in differential growing, there may be one side with good occlusion and the other side with not so good an occlusion. And for the nostrils, it's the same. The uh, orifices will not be the same size. And also nasal flow becomes more regular after disjunction. Not only does the air go through the nose, but the breathing will be improved and the child will sleep better. 
Oral flow was completely stopped in 70% of the children, 0 to 10 was good result, but we still have 3% uh, of children in whom it doesn't work. So I tell the parents that it may happen, that there may be a failure, and in uh, that case you have to look for something else. 10% of the children, dysfunction and rehabilitation will not be sufficient. Rehabilitation also involves a tongue. We use uh, elastics uh, and uh, rice grains uh, that are placed on the palate and must be kept there for 10 minutes. The children have to swallow the saliva, and keeping the uh, rice uh, grain on the palate means that the tongue has to be in the right position, the normal position. Chewing uh, with selective grinding and rehabilitation, we have to change the process. It's passive uh, with little devices, it's active with the child. We explain to them what the nose is. We tell them, push on your nose and you will see the shape of your nostrils change. We also show them how to uh, wash their nose, saline uh, in the nose, and uh, it, uh, the saline should go to the other nostril and the other way around. So they have to understand that. Smells also, we have three little bottles with different uh, fragrances so that they learn proprioception again. They can feel, they can smell, and if they can smell, it means that they have a good function. Alternate breathing, it's like chewing, you have to use both nostrils because if there is only one nostril being used, there will be asymmetry growing in the face. Breathing in, we use uh, toilet paper, and the toilet paper must be kept for one minute. So the child has to breathe in, and when he goes all blue in the face, we stop. Exhaling, we can do that with a flame and uh, propulsors, uh, orbicular devices uh, with a little screen that is only used for rehabilitation purposes. Transversal orbicularis, uh, the lower lip brought right up to the nose, the upper lip, the lower lip, sorry, that must be turned down in order to restore the um, muscle muscles uh, in the labial belt. That must be done 10 minutes a day uh, with the parents, and the parents can uh, play a role by pulling the, uh, the device for the orbicularis muscles, for instance. And if uh, they uh, play uh, the trumpet, for instance, it helps a lot. So aerophonoscope, picture before and picture after, you see that the cycle has become much more regular and uh, almost nothing here. It's just, it's because the uh, curve is so powerful, we should have uh, two comparisons uh, to show the difference in the air going through the nose. You remember the flow of a uh, watering uh, hose is, uh, multiplies the, um, flow by four. So here it's the same. This we use for very young children. They have to uh, help the plane take off and uh, the more they breathe through the nose, the more the uh, plane will take off. And there are other methods. We also use the uh, night guard, lingual guard. And this case, which is absolutely unbelievable, because I, I had to do a cone beam before and a cone beam after, and you will see the difference, because it opens up many different perspectives on the nasal breathing. So x-ray before, cone beam before, very tight orifices, and uh, as you can see on the uh, cross-section, one nostril isn't working at all. We have a flat curve on one nostril, to cycle totally irregular. I place the disjunctor and I ask the ENT to see the child, because uh, this is uh, the child is a child of a nurse working in the ENT ward, so everything uh, goes really fast. And the ENT says, "I'd like to uh, have a cone beam now that you have performed the disjunction." And I said, "Okay, if you want one, I'll give you one." That was a medical reason, otherwise I wouldn't have done it. I don't systematically do a cone beam after the treatment. You know, surgeons uh, don't uh, mind if they have to do an x-ray before and after. We don't do it that easily, but we may have to do it one day to show evidence. So I performed the disjunction as shown on the cone beam, and you see the orifices have been enlarged. And surprisingly, the... Uh, septum that was deviated and was closing the nostril has now straightened up. So in 10 days, simply because we performed the disjunction, the air starts going through the 
to both nostrils and the septum acted like a, a sail. It just straightened itself up. So I said, the sequela will be kept uh, for life. If you do nothing for the child, one nostril is blocked and the other one is uh, doing all the breathing, and there would have been consequences. There is no posterior crossbite in this case, only incisor crowding. So disjunction must be done early. As soon as you see a tight maxilla, regardless of the occlusion, we look at the bone and we treat the bone. And finally, we uh, improved the child's and uh, brought his function back to normal. I also use a small device made in uh, Belgium called Jawak. Two magnets were on the chin and on the forehead. I did. I recorded the sleep pattern of all the children with a molar crossbite. All of them had more than five uh, sleep apneas during the night, which is too high for children, abnormal. So in all the occlusion, uh, transversal occlusion issues, we have also a functional issue and a uh, respiratory issue, not just ventilation, breathing is involved. And again, you, you save the patient's life because the sleep apnea is a very serious um, disease in children. So what about the consequences of disjunction on breathing? Well, you decrease the nasal resistance, you improve the sleep, you improve fatigue, snoring disappears, the posture is improved, infectious diseases disappear, and also the face will change. And you have to work with the ENT specialist, desensitizing and uh, uh, remove um, the tonsils. But no, on the other hand, if you uh, remove the tonsils and you don't correct the breathing, one year later you have to do it again. And the child will have surgery again and again for vegetation. So in, it probably means you have taken the problem the other way around. And in order to push this one notch further, I'd like to introduce a syndrome that I was uh, worried about for months, the single incisor. This is a syndrome where the two buds have merged, so there is a single big incisor, completely symmetric. And there is an abnormal nasal fossa ratio. Following the merger, there are only three teeth instead of four, so everything is tight. The child uh, breathes only through the mouth. The cone beam shows total merger, no suture. And uh, I tried this junction, and it was a total failure, no change whatsoever, but I was doing my best. So what we do? What we did we do? We did surgery, early surgery in this child, and we actually created a lateral suture, which in turn allowed us to perform disjunction laterally from the central incisor, and we were able to push the central incisor to the right side, and that was the first forced case, but it was the first time that I uh, succeeded. In the previous three, we tried everything, and it did not work well, and it definitely didn't function well. And in this case, we were able to increase the child's nose, nose breathing, and the aesthetic result was much better. So when there is a single incisor, it's not an agent, it's not a, a congenitally missing tooth, it's because the two incisors have merged. Thank you very much for your attention.